Yaakov enlightens the OA college groups as he dramatically leads them on the Eli Cohen Trail, Shreel Eli Cohen in the Golan Heights. A resident of the Golan Heights, he is an expert in all things Eli Cohen. He is on the Golan Foreign Affairs Board and a leading spokesman for the Golan since the American recognition of Israeli sovereignty there. You will understand how he is, a mo how, how he is such a motivational speaker for the IDF soldiers and draftees. Yaakov, vivakasha. Okay, good evening. So it's 2 a.m. here, so I hope everyone can hear me. I'm gonna do my best to speak uh, out loud without uh, waking up my children. And before I introduce myself, I'd just like to uh, start with a little story. Uh, last Yom Atzmaut, just a few weeks ago, um, in the morning I'm in the hospital, my wife gives birth to our third daughter, perfect timing. And of course, you know, it's great news, but I miss the barbecue. And so when I come home that evening, my friend puts together just outside here, outside the window, my little barbecue area, puts together great steak. We're sitting down eating steaks. Now, I'm, I live four miles away from the border with Syria. And while we're sitting with this steak, two helicopters fly over us. And my friend says, oh, you know, the IDF is training. I said, can't be because it's, hol it's a holiday. You don't train on a holiday. The next thing we see while we're eating our steak is from these helicopters, missiles flying towards Syria, and we see big explosions in Syria. 20 minutes later, it's already all over social media, exactly where Iranian targets were attacked in Syria. And guess who, right? I mean, who could have done it? Why am I starting with this? Because when we, uh, I've been really studying the, the Eli Cohen matter for the last few months since the series came out. Every group come here wants to hear about Eli Cohen and, and I as a kid grew up on the story. So um, it's sometimes hard for us to, to understand how important what Eli did was because when we look at reality today where on social media, I find out that the IDF is striking Iranian targets and I'm seeing it live and I can upload it if I wanted to my story on Instagram and information is flowing, the intelligence world is totally different. So I'm gonna to present tonight uh, also the accomplishments of Eli Cohen and today in 2020, maybe half of them could have been uh, gotten in different resources, right? When you collect intelligence, there's human intelligence, there's uh, web intelligence, there's open source, there's, there's different ways of collecting intelligence and Eli Cohen was an agent on ground. Um, some of the things that were so urgent then, today we can look at it and say, ah, it's not so big. So yes, it is. In 2020, I can collect intelligence with my smartphone from my backyard eating a steak. Um, in, nine, in the 60s, things were very different. And with that said, I'll just say, of course, we, all we did while we were watching the strike is just continue eating our steak because that's reality here and nothing else happened. And with that said, I'll say a word about myself and I'll start sharing my screen. I'll just say I'm 32 years old. I'm married. I have three daughters. I've been living here for seven years. And the reason why I came here is because of my military service. I'm a Jerusalemite originally. My parents are American. Uh, for the past seven years, I've been living here due to my military service. Um, I've been serving in a tank unit that's located here in the Golan um, for almost 14 years now. Um, I was in for 10 years or nine and a half years uh, active service, now in reserve duty, and as Judy said, actually today I finished a motivational talk to the soldiers in the unit. I'm also an operational officer, but also a motivational speaker. So, but we're not here to talk about myself, so uh, I'm going to share my screen, and let's get going. So, uh, Eli Cohen, um, first of all, and before everything, I think we should say he was the loving husband of Nadia and a father to two daughters, Sophie and Irit, and Shai, his son, his third son that was born just before he was caught. Uh, we're talking about, as I think it's emphasized a lot in the series, he's an immigrant, but I would say he's also from a family of immigrants. Uh, his family's originally from Syria. They immigrate to uh, uh, Egypt, he is born in Alexandria. And so he has the Syrian background, but he grows up in Egypt. 
Um, I think one, uh, uh, one thing people don't know about him is that he was a star in Jewish studies and the local rabbi was planning and sending him to be ordained as a rabbi actually. And due to World War II, he was stuck in, in Egypt. So he had to go learn electricity and then the path of his life changed. Um, and from a young age, people noticed that he has an incredible memory. Uh, there's a story I heard recently where he's sitting on a weekend with his brother and he tells his brother, check this out. And he sees 10 cars passing by. And then he tells his brother 10 license plates. He remembers, he just gets it. So when we understand what he was doing in Syria, um, you can understand this was a great, great ability um, uh, thing he had. Now, in 1949, his family, after the establishment of the state of Israel, his family is very Zionist. And of course, around the Arab world, um, there's a lot of uh, pressure on the Jews. And so his family makes Aliyah to Israel. Eli is a student and he tells his family, give me a few more months, I'm joining y'all. Those few months turn to be eight years. And those eight years are actually eight years that most people I think don't know in the biography of Eli Cohen. Eli Cohen's first country of operation was not Syria. He operates in Egypt, helping Jews to immigrate to Israel. And in the early fifties, there's a whole deal in, I don't know what it's called in English, but in Hebrew, it's called Esek Abish, like the, the deal that got messed up. Israel had this whole issue with spies in Egypt, trying to, whole. Oh, Thing they were trying to create to do in Egypt to, to hurt the regime there, um, which failed. The two local Jewish Egyptians that are the spies for Israel actually were friends of Eli Cohen and he owned the apartment they were operating from. So Eli Cohen is actually arrested by the Egyptian intelligence and they already have his picture and they have knowledge about him and you'll see how that, that's crucial very soon. Um, and so the pressure starts uh, uh, rising, and in 1957, right, yeah, he he makes aliyah to Israel. Just a few days later, he gets call a call to come to the uh, Egyptian intelligence. Uh, again, they want to check him out on something. So you can understand he was already on their, uh, I would say, on the spotlight. So now, uh, with that said. Um, what he comes to Israel, right, uh, 1957, uh, and right away he applies, right, he already has some background, which people don't really know, but again, but you can imagine who was he working with trying to smuggle Jews out of Egypt to Israel. So he already has connection in different intelligence organizations in Israel, and he applies for the Mossad. He applies for the Mossad, and there's a paper of his, his uh, application. He says, I fully, I speak mother language. He can speak five different languages, one of them is Arabic, and he can speak Arabic in different, uh, I'm losing my English now at 2 a.m., but, uh, you know, people speak Arabic differently, even within Israel, and also Egypt, Syria, it's different, uh, I'm losing the different word. Different dialects, different Thank dialects. Thank you, different dialects, okay? Just like uh, my mother's from the South, so I always say y'all, and you can tell, oh, he's from the South. So there's different dialects, and Eli actually knows to speak the Egyptian dialect, the Syrian dialect, because of his, his, uh, his grandparents coming from there, uh, and parents. So this guy, you understand, he's very skillful, but the Mossad turns him down. He, he says, I'm willing to go to operate in a foreign country. He's turned down by the Mossad, uh, mainly because in his resume, he was arrested already by the Egyptian intelligence, meaning they know of him. Okay, so many times people said, oh, they just dumped him. He was, no, it just didn't make sense to take him. So he works for the Mossad for a few years, just in uh, listening to, to Arab media, collecting from their uh, open source intelligence. But then uh, budget issues, he's cut off. He becomes a clerk. And in 1960, and now we're going to reach his mission, there's a lot of pressure in Israel regarding Syria. A rumor is that the Mossad made sure he'll get fired from his job as a clerk. And then they approach him with a job offer, which of course, this, that's his dream, uh, to go be Israel's eyes and ears in Syria. Now we have to say, uh, what was he looking for in Syria? There are two crucial things happening in Syria those days. One, between 1958 and 1961, people don't really remember it, but there's what we call, I'm translating it from Hebrew, the Arab Repub, the Joint Arab Republic. United Arab Republic. Basically, Egypt and Syria united to sort of one state. 
and they were planning on having other countries join in. And the goal was to basically unite the Arab world. And then that's, of course, a great threat to Israel. And Israel doesn't understand what the heck is happening there. What, 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 right? Where is the wind blowing in Damascus? Where is it going? What's going on? And there's a lot of pressure to, to have someone who can report from there. Second thing is the border with Israel. This is the Golan Heights where I live. Um, you see the heights, you see the mountains. Let's see it in eye and look what the Golan Heights controls. It controls Northern Galilee and it controls the most important water source in Israel, the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret, and the waterheads, okay? So the waterheads of the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Galilee, we're talking about the Middle East, the dry region, are all controlled from here. The Golan those days is a closed military zone full of Syrian soldiers, many, many Syrian soldiers, artillery units, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a view from the Golan. You can see it from a lookout in the Golan. You're overlooking the whole valley under you. You're controlling it. And uh, this was, I think, perfectly shown in the first episode of The Spy, where here in Kibbutz En Gev, there's the scene where the farmers are working their land and suddenly, boom, right? Rockets start landing. Um, and so um, this is, uh, this, there's a lot of pressure there, right? We're talking about uh, between 1948 to 1967, when the Syrians controlled the Golan, we called it in the Syrian Golan, uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, about 200 Israeli casualties from rockets being shot there. Imagine reality in Gaza today where you have, uh, where you have, you know, the terrorists can decide to shoot at our people and then you have a day in bomb shelter and casualties and the whole economy shut down. That's reality in Northern Israel. And so again, people are trying to understand where are the Syrians going to? And you need to understand that Syria from its establishment in 46, every few years, there's some sort of, uh, of coup. Uh, 1961, there's one, 1963, there's one. So it's very hard to understand what's happening there. So with that said, um, 1960, Ellie starts his training and they build up a cover story for him, which I'm sure if you're watching this, you watch the spy. And so Kamil Amin Thabit, uh, a son of Syrians who immigrated, right? His parents died and he is now in Argentina. He goes to Argentina. He spends there uh, close to a year. Okay, he did nine months of training, another year in Argentina. And his greatest accomplishment in Argentina, aside from, uh, is everything okay here? I see, one second. Sorry, okay. someone just by accident shared their screen. So please share yours. Gotcha. Again. Okay. I was wondering. So he really uh, gets around. He gets his word around. He goes to big parties. He, he gets connected to the right people. And one of the uh, right people is this guy here. This is what he looks like in the series. This is what it looks like in real life. Amin El Hafiz, uh, the military attache in Argentina, uh, who will eventually become the president of Syria when Ellie is caught. So they built some sort of connection. Now, when I was preparing for this, I was wondering, you know, this was a very, the whole story of Ellie Cohen, it, it creates a lot of irritation of denial in the, in the Arab world. So I just read in a Syrian paper that they deny, they say that Ellie Cohen did not, never met Amin al-Khafiz until he was caught, until the trial. It's a lie that was shown by, you know, the Zionist in the spy. So there's actually pictures of them together in Argentina, just for that matter, okay? I couldn't put my hand on one of them, but I know Ellie Cohen's brother has a picture of both of them together. So he builds his reputation, he gets his connections, and in 1962, he gets into Syria. This is the, an Israeli actor, but in the series, uh, uh, Sheikh Majad uh, El Arad, okay? This is the guy who uh, he meets randomly, knowing he's the guy who can get him in. And this wealthy uh, uh, a businessman brings him into Syria. What is not mentioned in the series, and I'll talk about that later, that this Majid uh, El Arad guy is actually working for the CIA. Okay, this is something you don't see in the series. He's a CIA agent who's bringing in a Mossad agent to Syria. Now, did they know about this? Did the CIA know who Ali Khan was? We can speculate on that. So this guy is not just. Ellie's not fooling just him. This guy also has his own intentions. We need to understand that. Uh, he makes it into Syria, and very soon again, he connects to the right people. What you see here is an incredible, incredible picture. The five pictures here, it's a very famous picture. This is the fi top five ministers, including the president, Amin Hafiz, of the Syrian government. 
Ellie Cohen's right here behind. Okay, this is how deep, right? In the Syrian paper, which I read today, they, they said he, he was just another spy. No, he wasn't. This is the starting five of Syrian politics. He's here with them. He has a, a radio show, a talk show, a corner in a talk show. He's a star. This guy is a star. He's all over. He, he, he's a consultant to Syrian officials. He has himself all over. He's hosting parties with Syrian officials. He's all over the place, and he's deep, deep inside. Our man, Damascus, is deeply integrated into the Syrian government. Now, I'm running. I see those questions popping up. We'll see the question and answers, because I just I have to finish in 20 minutes uh, this incredible topic. So um, uh, one thing I want to mention is Eli's visit to the Golan, which is documented in the series. Here is the picture from the series. Uh, it happened. Eli Cohen visits the Golan three times. Uh, we even have a picture. Now, just to understand, for this picture to be taken, this is a closed military zone. He's not even allowed in. He, was, he got in because he was friends with the nephew of the chief of staff of Syria, who's also in the series, uh, Moaz, this guy here. And so Eli Cohen three times visits the Golan, uh, collects important intelligence, um, and we'll talk about his accomplishments shortly. I'm just going to say that today in the Golan, we have the Eli Cohen Trail, eight stops, six of them, Eli Cohen personally was there. We know there's evidence Eli Cohen was there. Um, and when you guys, God willing, are able to come back to Israel, it's really worth it. This is the final stop. It's a... It's a uh, statue of, of Nadia and the kids looking towards Damascus, and it says, waiting for Eli. So um, that's the Eli Cohen Trail. Now, with that said, what I want to do now, I'm going to talk about his accomplishments, for real, and then we'll talk about myths and things that come up in the series. So I think, again, remember my opening story about how in the intelligence world changed. Uh, one of the greatest things is that Eli Cohen is able to reveal to the Israeli uh, intelligence and Israeli decision makers what's really happening in Syria. Who's connected to you? What are the different integrities? Who, who's against you? Who really makes is the real decision maker? Who's pulling the strings? He's able to give a very good understanding um, about every little move, political, anything that has an influence in Israel, Israel knows of. Uh, we know even too much. And when we talk about Eli being caught, you'll see how reports in Israel give things that there's, there's results for elections in Syria. Uh, no one knows about it. It's a secret vote in the parliament and Eli is there. So it's reported in Israel on Israeli news before the Syrians know. And that's what makes people suspicious. Um, second thing is Syria, after breaking off from Egypt in 1961, from their United Arab things, starts getting closer to Iraq. And there's plans for a joint headquarters, a military headquarters, and Eli is able to warn Israel about this thing. Um, third thing is the Jordan River uh, Waterheads Diversion Plan. This is a major thing which is documented in the series as Shalal. Um, many people question, is it true? Yes, it's true. The Syrians, remember, are, con are, control are overlooking the Sea of Galilee, and they're controlling the waterheads uh, right, that the Sea of Galilee basically gets its water from. So the Syrians make a plan to have this whole pipe system the contractor that's hired for this mission is a guy named Mohammed bin Laden. Yes, the father of Osama. Eli did not meet Osama, but they made it, you know, it, was, it looked good in the series. Um, and Mohammed bin Laden is hired, and Eli, as an experienced uh, businessman, is uh, asked to use his connections and shipment and different things, part of his cover story, to help bin Laden bring in these pipes to Syria do different things. So Eli really understands what's happening here. He warns Israel and Israel is able to bomb the vehicles and uh, stop this thing, which was dangerous for the state of Israel. Uh, next thing is revealing this was not documented in a series. Eli reveals a Nazi criminal named Franz Rademacher who's hiding in Syria. By the way, this guy is like a, a spy for the CIA, but also a spy for the Syrian intelligence against the CIA. Um, something messed up with this guy, and, and when we talk about Ellie being caught, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that he started hanging around this guy, and maybe this guy had a part in, in his fall. Uh, the USSR, Soviet Union, has a huge deal with Syria, giving them T-54 tanks. Those who saw my promotion video, that's where the tank comes from. Uh, so Ellie's able to warn that they're getting new tanks and new airplanes. Uh, exact locations of the 10th Division in the Golan. Uh, the unit sitting in the Golan, Eli visits here, so he's able to really give Israel a perfect understanding of where exactly the troops are, 
um, how are they set up, etc. And uh, at some point, the Golan commander is trying to do different things to escalate the situation with Israel without the Syrian general staff wanting this. And so Israel is able, again, to know about this and warn whoever they have to warn because Eli gives that information. Uh, last but not least, at some point, this is another, it looks that's like something very little because today we would see it on social media very easily. But at some point when the Syrians get the 40 new planes, it, people in Israel are very worried. And Eli is able to report that uh, the manpower problem the Syrians have uh, creates the fact that only four new planes are in action. So we are able to understand really how, how bad the threat is. So these are his main accomplishments. Uh, and with that said, let's say what did not happen in the spy, and then it looks like my time is running out. Um, so first of all, let's talk about the end. There is a few till today, we don't know how did it end. Um, the official Syrian uh, uh, thing says that the Indian Eli was, Eli chose his location. He rented an apartment in a place where he can watch uh, the Syrian uh, defense ministry on one hand, but he can be by different uh, diplomatic uh, um, embassies, different embassies, which have antennas. So then no one can notice that he's reporting. And the Indian embassy apparently is complaining that they have problems with reception. So the Syrians are trying to help their Indian friends. And whoa, what's happening here? Uh, they understand Eli Cohen is screwing up the whole thing. Um, the second thing is uh, Egyptian intelligence. Remember, Eli Cohen was revealed to the Egyptian intelligence. They have his pictures, they have his documents. And then this guy's all over the place. He's in the media and everything. He's a star there. And maybe the Egyptians warned. Um, too much information revealed in Israel I touched. CIA, two months before Eli's arrested, the, Syrian, the Syrians catch a network of CIA agents, including Sheikh, uh, which I mentioned, uh, Sheikh El Arab. Um, they start investigating, and Eli Cohen apparently was hanging around a lot uh, with these guys. So that, that uh, brings this very soon, trying to track the CIA, they reach Eli Cohen. One last thing, which is being spoken a lot in Israel in the past few weeks, Eli Cohen was Agent 566. What people don't know is that two months later, Agent 565, uh, uh, who's operating in Egypt, is also caught. In Eli Cohen's trial, which I'll say a word about in a second, uh, the Syrians confront him with different things he gave Israel. One of the things they confront him with is information Eli gave Israel, meaning they're reading out from a paper. They said, in this and this date, you reported to Israel so-and-so. Eli apparently doesn't notice that they're reading out of the paper he actually delivered to Israel, meaning that was caught in the Israeli side, right? Eli wasn't writing it, he was doing Morse. So the Syrians put their hand on something that belongs to the Mossad, and that leads to a question, was there a leak from the Mossad that made uh, the Mossad lose two of the best fighters they had in Egypt and in Damascus within two months? Um, and that's a question that, of course, will be stay open. Uh, what wasn't exact, and then uh, questions. What wasn't exact in the series? First of all, I think uh, in the series, they really tried showing how Eli was eager to prove himself. So, uh, for example, in his first night in Argentina, he already jumps into the office of Amin al-Khafiz, and he gets secret things, and the whole, it gets, right, there's a mess. They have to kill a Syrian agent. Um, so I think it was over-dramatized. Of course, his mission in Argentina is to get into Syria. There's no way that is true. But I think they were trying to emphasize uh, the, the opinion that says that he wasn't careful enough, that he was very eager and he, didn't, he wasn't careful enough for himself. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, in, in general, he wasn't 007. Let's put it that way. But in Argentina, all he did was connect to the right people. Uh, Shalal, Eli did report about the secret uh, plan. He wasn't standing there with the Syrians watching it being bombed. Actually, he was away from Syria while it was being bombed. It was right before he was caught. And that was one of the things that actually uh, made the Syrians wonder what's going on here. Um, the visits to the Golan uh, are over-dramatized, right? He runs to the fence to warn an Israeli farmer that the Syrians are coming. Never happened. Okay, never happened, of course. Um, the job offer to be the deputy security minister never happened. He did, he was a consultant in the Ministry of Defense. He had his hands all over papers that he shouldn't have had, um, but it's not true. They didn't offer him that. And one last thing, which I'm, I don't recall now, if they showed it in the series, I don't want to break anyone's hearts here. Uh, maybe the most famous myth 
about Eli Cohen is the eucalyptus trees, right? That he tells the Syrians, plant the eucalyptus trees around your bunkers, you'll have shade. And then in 1967, Israel is able to bomb all the bunkers. Uh, eucalyptus trees take decades to grow. Couldn't have happened. More than that, the Israeli intelligence says we had almost perfect understanding. Eli did help us get a better picture of what's happening there and where the forces are. We're not, we knew where the bunkers are. And yes, a lot of them were by eucalyptus trees, but that's a Syrian issue. Uh, so I hope I don't break anyone's hearts. Eli Cohen never did the eucalyptus stuff. It's a myth. No one understands where the myth comes from. Uh, Eli was caught for the reasons I said. He was brought to trial. Uh, he was in Israel. Uh, for the Brit Milah of his third son, of his first son, third child. And, um, and what happens is that um, he comes while he's away for two months. People recently, in the recent series in Israel, people said, you know, the general uh, thing you see in the series is that Eli's eager to do his job. At some point he says, maybe I should back off. And uh, they, right, the prime minister comes and says, you're, you're so important, you've got to do it. Um, in his last visit in Israel, Eli was a very calm and in control person. In his last visit, his siblings say he was nervous. He was yelling at people. He, he wasn't himself. When he says goodbye to Nadia, she feels something is wrong. Meaning, um, meaning uh, he, he didn't want to come back. And just to understand, the situation in Syria in those days are, they already revealed that Eli Cohen is a spy. They thought he was an Egyptian or Iraqi spy. So it took them a few more months, meaning uh, it, it's a very sad topic, but it's, again, in public uh, uh, discussion in Israel today. Was Eli Cohen sent as that? And the answer, unfortunately, might be that he, he was already what we call a burnt spy. He shouldn't have gone back. He shouldn't have come back, although he was such an incredible uh, uh, source of knowledge and he did such incredible things. CIA guys are caught. Uh, he himself had different incidents. He gave out crucial information that only he could have known about, about the, the water project, and he shouldn't have been sent back. And that's why also his family has a lot of anger towards uh, uh, the system, I would say. When he is brought to trial, and this is an amazing thing I learned recently, uh, the jury judging him are all top people from the people who came to his parties. They are scared to death. If Eli Cohen will reveal the truth, right, they're going to be in trial. And there's sort of an understanding between Eli Cohen and his judges that he denies that he knows them, and then they'll make sure that he's, he'll stay alive. Of course, they betray him. But just to understand, this is the Eli Cohen is right here dressed up in a party in a restaurant. This is the head of the jury judging him. Okay. Eli Cohen sits in front of him and says, I do not know you. He asks, do you know me? Do you know anyone here? He says, I don't. So he doesn't give away the justice, but of course they betray him. And um, this is the picture I'm going to end with, and I'll pass on the mic. Um, uh, this is the final picture I'll show because I don't want to show the picture of the hanging. It's too painful. Uh, this is the chief rabbi of Damascus. This is the real picture of the opening scene in the series. Uh, where in the middle of the night the rabbi is called, uh, the Syrians uh, did not, so many requests were made. The Pope said, please let him, you know, do something. Israel offered money, ransom, information, and uh, everything failed because the Syrians, Amin al-Khafiz says years later, he says, this guy was a traitor. It's not just he worked for Israel. He's an Arab. He came from us. He was Syrian, Egyptian. I, I can't forgive this thing. And, and so it's such a humiliation for them that they, they're not able to give it up. And just understand, Eli's coin till the last moment gets information from the Mossad saying, don't worry, even if you see him hung, it's not going to happen. The Syrians won't do it. The Syrians did it. They did respect his last request to see a rabbi. And he was able to write the last letter. And when he's sentenced to death, um, he said, they, they say in his, in his face, they say, you're a traitor. And he says, I'm not a traitor. I was a, I was a servant of my country. I was a messenger for my people, and I did what I had to do for my country. Um, so this is the last picture when he says the last pair with the rabbi and gives him the letter. And uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to pass on the mic. Thank you, Yaakov. Um, that was great. Um, for anyone that has any questions, um, we will answer those at the after our next speaker. So I'm going to introduce Rabbi Al Ghazi 
who um, is a native of Argentina. He studied at Columbia University and the Jewish Theological Seminary. He also founded the Coalition for Israel. But the reason why he's here is to um, give us a little bit of personal insight into who Ellie Cohen was. He's, um, he's here because his mother is actually Ellie Cohen's first cousin by virtue of the fact that their mothers were sisters, if we can follow along with that family tree. Um, so with that being said, um, Rabbi al -Ghazi. Shalom to everyone. I want to uh, first of all congratulate all of you for being involved in the very sacred work of helping the Jewish peoples return to its land after 2000 years. And everyone who participates in these kind of activities, and you especially as young professionals, have a great merit and I am very proud to be here with you. And I want to, to thank Judy for inviting me for this program. Um, it is my great pleasure to be able to join with you and, uh, and wish you the very best. And I hope that all of us together will continue to see the full redemption of Am Israel, Jewish people, and the return and, the, and, and to be able to bring um, to the world. If, when Israel will find peace, the world will be at peace. Uh, I wanna thank, first of all, uh, Yaakov for a very beautiful presentation. And I learned also a lot of things about it. Um, I just want to add uh, something personal. My cousin, <clears throat> one of my cousins, went to Israel um, some years ago and uh, accidentally met someone who invited him to the house. And when they came to the house, it happened to be that he spoke about his own um, grandmother, uh, Zakia, and the woman who was in the house, who was uh, Eli's mother, uh, was so surprised and said, who, Z you are Zakia? And, and that's how we discovered that the, the families were connected. And we came back to Argentina. Uh, he told us about it. We were all very, very happy and excited that we were able to um, connect with this uh, wonderful human being and wonderful hero of Am Israel. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I want to tell you that uh, uh, recently, as a result of the movie, many of the members of the family have created a, a large WhatsApp uh, group and you know how the WhatsApp group go, you know, every time that uh, somebody joins or says a word, there's a beep and a beep and a beep. And I've been receiving <laughs> for the last few days, uh, constant beeps from all of these people who uh, are participating and sharing information. Um, there are families in, in Latin America, of course, many of them, and in Israel, <laughs> uh, as well as other parts of the world. Um, there are a couple of things that I wanted to say about, first of all, um, what I know about my mother's um, and my, my, my grandmother. Uh, they were born in, in Halab, in, Ale in Aleppo. Um, and due to financial circumstances, both families moved to Cairo. Um, my grandfather uh, moved uh, from Argentina in 1921 or 1922. Um, the family of Elikon, of course, remained there for a much longer time. Um, it is true, by the way, as Yaakov said, that uh, the Arabic spoken by Syrian uh, people is different. So when you come to Cairo and you speak, as, as I do sometimes a little bit, if I, I said a word in Arabic, immediately they said, oh, you are Syrian. So the, the, the dialect is very, very specific and, and, and different. So, um, Eli had a great advantage in, in, in being, in having that Syrian background, even though he wasn't uh, actually, uh, has not lived a long time in Syria. Um, other aspect of, of the um, family that I wanted to mention is that uh, we discovered in, um, after his death, uh, after in fact, many years after his death, upon the death of one of the people that I know in Argentina who was, one of the handlers, apparently, for the Mossad. Um, I wonder if you his name, you know, that's what I heard. And, and he was um, a family, also a member of our family, a close family uh, friend, actually, of our family. 
And um, he didn't say much about it. Actually, he, we only discovered it indirectly. So um, some I even heard, and, and I'm not really, can I confirm this from this WhatsApp group, that he had gone or had been in one of our cousins' uh, home for, for dinner. Um, so he spent some time in Argentina. Obviously, he must have um, been very careful about uh, not contacting people, the family. Um, and, uh, but it was for us a, a personal great loss. Um, I remember I was in high school at that time, uh, and the president of Argentina uh, pleaded with um, Syria as well to, to let him go. All of us were very, even before I knew that we were related, um, we were very, very sad. Um, you know, for me, uh, being part of the family, even a distant family, Eddie Cohen looks very much like my brother. I have a brother who looks almost exactly like him. And uh, a bunch of David's. And I'm oh, sorry. And um, what I, I thought uh, that, um, you know, it, it is a, a beautiful thing to see, first of all, <clears throat> that somebody can sacrifice himself for the sake of other people. And I think we, we know in Hebrew, we have an expression, Kiddush Hashem, that we sanctify God's name by our dedication, by our devotion, by our ability to, you know, transcend our interests and even safety for the sake of others. And uh, it's a great honor for me, even in a distant form, to be a part of, of this great family. And, you know, on behalf of all the people, the hundreds of people that, that I got with, that I, I told them about this meeting, uh, you have from all of them, um, you know, our, our greatest uh, appreciation. But I want to end with one thought. I think that everybody in some way or another has somebody in the family, in the present or in the future, who is going to be a hero, just like Eli Cohen, on behalf of Israel. Thank you. Um, okay, so with that, I guess we'll start um, our Q and A. Um, uh, I have your third, I started writing answers. I have 38 questions there, so. Okay, so if you okay, wanna so go, I mean, going. by yeah. all means, I, I, you can, uh, uh, okay. you wanna take I, the lead not, and read the question and who asked it. Yeah. I, also, not, if you have a question, I guess you can raise your hand in the thing and we can call on you too. Okay, so I'm not gonna say all the names, I just wrote it down quickly. Um, Joseph was asking, was there any retribution on the Syrian Jewish community? So if I understood correctly the question, yes, a few Syrian Jews were arrested. Uh, they were suspected to help Eli. Uh, one of them was recently interviewed and he says uh, that he saw Eli in prison being tortured. Uh, he was also tortured and then he escaped from Syria. He had nothing to do with them, but since Eli brought a few things in his store, he was suspected that maybe there's something here. Eli was a lone wolf. Meaning, uh, aside from the speculations on the CIA connections, no connection to the Jewish community. Uh, there were other Israelis operating in the region. He didn't know about, didn't know about him. He was a lone wolf. Uh, second question, is there any, someone asked, is, do we have voice? Do we have documentation of him? We do have a few pictures. Um, his trial, we have the protocols. We can't hear his voice, but remember, he's, he had a radio show on the Syrian national radio. He had a very, very popular uh, uh, a spot there. So we do have interviews of him as Kamil Amin Thabit. You can Google it, you'll hear it. And you'll hear uh, uh, George Saif, who also is in the series, you'll hear him praising uh, the brother Kamil Amin Thabit, and you'll, you'll hear Eli speaking with passion about his love to Syria. Um, that's regarding that. Um, Someone wrote here, Eli Cohen is a legend in Jewish communities around the world. How is it in England, in Israel? There isn't a city in Israel that will, doesn't have a street, a school, something for Eli Cohen. He's a national hero. Here in the Golan, we have a village named for him called Eliad, which means Eli forever. Um, I don't think there's an Israeli that doesn't, you don't say the name Eli Cohen, he doesn't say, oh, he, everyone knows who Eli Cohen is. Um, so that's regarding that. Status of, status of his remains. And a few years ago, uh, a video was revealed of his body being taken off and, and put in a truck. Um, there are different rumors about it. During the Syrian civil war, there were times where large parts of Damascus were under the control of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. 
And there are locals, again, social media that show evidence that say, uh, we saw ISIS fighters going through graveyards. Now, remember a few, uh, a year ago, I think it was, it was three elections already, but right before the first elections last year, uh, Ru with Russian help, Israel brings back to burial Zachary Baumel after decades where his body was missing in Syria. So uh, after that, there were a lot of rumors that the Russians have Eli Cohen's body already. People were very excited in Israel. It turned out to be false, unfortunately, but Israel has been very active in the past nine years when there's chaos in Syria. Yes, even hiring ISIS fighters, apparently, I'm speculating, but I, I believe the evidence to go through graves and look for Eli Cohen and try bringing him home. Uh, his watch was brought home three years ago. The Mossad was able to bring his watch. Um, so that's regarding that. Yeah, Kov, I do want to read one question from Sharona sure. Whistler, Go which I it. think everybody probably has on their minds. Go Sharona wrote, my heart is a little broken about the eucalyptus trees. <laughs> How did that become so profound in the Ellie Cohen story if it's not true? So, I'm sure you get this all the time after you reveal that tidbit of information. And no one is able to say. No, no one knows. I'm sure there's like a tour guide, 90-year-old tour guide sitting somewhere laughing or something. Because um, he did give information. And it is true that sometimes we were able to see where the bunkers are because of the eucalyptus trees. No one can track down. Uh, they interviewed Israeli intelligence officials from 1967 and pilots. And they said, they said we had maps for years. We, yes, at Liel, but we knew you were able to see by aerial footage where the bunkers are. We did not. I, I don't know. I grew, I grew up on the Smith. You need to understand. I remember my first trip to the Golan as a kid in second grade. And they're telling us about it. And, and then you grew up and you realize it's, it's just a myth. So, you know, it, it's a great story. It's just a myth. Um, now someone Mike, Michael Goodman raised his hand here. So, Michael, I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask your question. All right, thanks. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, in Israel, is uh, Jonathan Pollard held in a similar level of esteem as Ellie Cohn? Thanks. Uh, whoa. Um, in Israel, there's a lot of love and sympathy and respect for Jonathan Pollard, also for what he did for Israel. Uh, also a lot of sympathy about what people feel as he was ditched um, by Israeli officials. Um, but it's different. It's definitely different. Um, you know, he was operating in the United States of America, not undercover in Syria. So I, I wouldn't compare, even though we did something great for the state of Israel, which, which helped us, uh, I wouldn't compare the two. Someone asked me about the Mossad recruiting. Do they choose you? Do you choose them? First of all, the Mossad today, you can open up a newspaper, websites, and you'll see the Mossad offering jobs, including social media. Secondly, um, the Mossad will approach you. Uh, secret services in general can approach you, send you a letter and say, yeah, I can tell you when I left the army, I got a letter from uh, the Shin Bet. Okay, uh, um, yeah, I guess you can say, I don't know, Israeli uh, secret services, inner uh, interior secret services. I got just the letter. I'm sure many people in my rank discharging got it, offering me to come for, by the way, two of my friends went in. So, um, so that's that. And someone asked, why did the United Arab Republic fall apart? So uh, the Syrian army pushed for it to be established at first because the co communist uh, um, party in Syria was very strong and they wanted to reduce their power. So they joined Nasser. But then what happens is that Nasser becomes a strong guy and he doesn't give a darn about Syria. Syria thought we're going to something, you know, we're going to be equal here, we're partners. And Nasser was just like, okay, I'm the big boss, you guys are under me and the people of Syria are not getting anything. So Syrians got sick of it, and they said, no thanks, and the, uh, there was a, a, a coup there, and, uh, and the new guy coming in said, guys, we're out of this deal. Okay, uh, other questions? Uh, uh, you'll help me, guys, because uh, there's lots of them. Uh, was he in Argentina around the time Eichmann was captured by the Mossad? Correct me if I'm wrong. I, no, I think Eichmann was before, just before. For sure he has no connection with it, but I'm pretty sure Eichmann is before. Uh, did Eli stop an attack on Northern Israel? So he did, uh, I mentioned that he warned Israel that the uh, Syrian commander, regional commander is, 
is uh, seeking to raise tension. However, uh, unlike the Syrian uh, government, they don't want it, but he was seeking for it. But uh, what was described in the series, uh, Liz asked this, what was described in the series that he runs to the border and he warns, never happened. Um, Arab classes of my college after 60 words spoke of Eliyahu Cohen with awe that he was successful. Okay, coup. Whoa, so I say coup? Thank you. Okay, there you go. A lot to learn. My English is not perfect. Oh, I see it's a private message. Oops. So it's a coup, not a coup. Okay, gotcha. Uh, okay, other question. Oh, how? Here, I see here, um, Peter asked, how did he travel back and forth from Syria to Israel? Uh, he did it three times. He traveled three times in three years to Israel. So basically, he would go to Europe, right? He was going on a business trip to Europe. And then he, through Europe, he would come, right, switch identities, come to Israel, and then back to Europe. So that's how he did it. By the way, there are rumors, again, that he was in Jordan and in Argentina on missions by the Syrian government with Syrian officials. Uh, they deny it. Uh, that's that. Okay. Let's look at this last question from Steve Feldman. Are young Israelis taught about Eli Cohen, a true hero? And would you agree that all young diaspora Jews would be taught about him? I, I think, first of all, I'll say again, um, I think someone else also asked, um, there isn't a city in Israel without an Eli Cohen street in it. Uh, there, there's a main train station that was named for him. There is a village in Israel named for him. Schools are named for him, synagogue. I'm saying there's not one city that doesn't have a public building named for Eli Cohen. Um, and he is a true, a true hero there. We, we grew up in him. I remember, I'm telling you, I grew up on the eucalyptus trees, but I knew from a very young age that there is a hero called Eli Cohen, our man in Damascus. Um, I agree that every, I think every Jew should be taught about him. Uh, it's a lesson of dedication, of courage, of, of uh, um, initiative. I'll say a word about it uh, in my conclusion. I still have a conclusion to say, a few words to say, so. Okay, and our final question is gonna be from Wendy who rose her hand. Wendy, I'm gonna unmute you. And then after this final question, Yaakov will have you conclude for us. You said that the, um, Syrians were or were disappointed in him that they felt betrayed so they they never realized that he was Jewish so they realized but they said you know there's Arab is sort of an ethnicity so there's a Muslim Arab there's a Christian Arab there's a Jewish Arab and they said you you came from us the fact that you're Jewish doesn't mean you came from an Arab country now that's what they say, but just remember, if Eli Cohen would be released, if he would open his mouth, remember the president when it was in his parties, his judges were in his parties. He knew so much. If he would just open his mouth, right, just to understand, what was Eli Cohen hung for? What does his, uh, um, what, what does it say on him? It says the reason why he was hung is because he entered a closed military zone, which is a death penalty. What's the closed military zone? The Golan Heights, right? Three times in the ground. That's what he did. If he would say that he, how much he betrayed, the people would start asking, what's going on in my country? We're talking about dictators, right? It is not democracy. People shouldn't know what's happening. If the people understand how corrupt things are and how stupid, I'm sorry to say, but how stupid they were that Eli was able to fool them uh, and do whatever he wanted and put his hands on anything he needed, then the people, it, it would, it, you know, it was a disgrace for the Syrians. They were humiliated by it. They didn't want this guy to open his mouth. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't let him out. So um, with that said, um, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, those who want to contact me, Slingshot Israel on Facebook or uh, Slingshot 188 on Instagram, feel free to contact me because I see there's many more questions and even if we would do three hours, it wouldn't be enough. It's, it's such an incredible topic. And I must say a word. First of all, I want to say a word about the series. Uh, with criticizing, first of all, let's quote Nadia. Nadia and Sophie Cohen, Ellie's oldest daughter, said, we're very angry at some things shown in the series, that they showed Ellie that he wasn't careful enough, et cetera, et cetera. But we're happy it came out. We're happy it came out because it brought Ellie back again to the front light and to get the honor he deserves. So even if some things are not true, and some things may, you know, drew him in a bad light. Bottom line, 
is that um, a road, now you see there's now different things happening in Israel, public discussion, and people were saying, we want answers. We want the Mossad to give us answers. You know, was it really Elif's fault that he was caught, like the Mossad claimed, or maybe actually the Mossad was wrong? So, so that's that. Uh, what I want to end with um, is something, and here I'm going to quote a colleague of mine who I hosted uh, for a webinar last week, and, and his conclusion brought tears to my eyes, and, and I felt that's what I want to conclude here also with. Uh, so I'm going to take you uh, to Saving Private Ryan, the movie. Um, young professionals, I hope you're not too young and you know Saving Private Ryan. This is the final scene when Private Ryan now, you know, Captain John, who ran this whole uh, crazy operation to reach Private Ryan and bring him back to the family, uh, it's his last moments, and this is what he tells him. Earn it, earn this, earn the effort, earn the sacrifice. And um, one I saw before, at least I never did, is this picture. Uh, this is the official Syrian publication that they caught an Israeli spy a few months after. Uh, we started with the iconic picture of Eli Cohen right, this beautiful young man, and look what he looks like here. This is after he was tortured. Look what they did to him. Um, Eli was there for us, and he paid the heaviest price possible. And for me, as someone who lives in the Golan, in the land that he did so much for, um, those words, earn it, when I look at this uh, uh, thrashed face, I feel it's, that's what it says to us. Earn it. I did something for you, for the people who live in the Golan today, for the people of Israel, for the Jewish nation. Make the price worth it. Earn it. Live a meaningful life and do things for this country so my sacrifice will be worth it. Um, so that's Eli, and I think, again, uh, a role model for all of us. And especially, I can say, the people of the Golan, we have the Eli Cohen Trail here, the, the Eli Cohen, uh, uh, Eli Ad, Moshav, names for Eli Cohen. And uh, a synagogue that's being built in these days named for Eli Cohen in, in one of the uh, villages here. And uh, we feel we owe a lot to this man who, who, as the Prime Minister of Israel said in 1967, the Golan was able to be redeemed in two days. And Eli Cohen's uh, actions in the years before saved a lot of lives of Israelis and helped us uh, 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 come back to, this, uh, to the land of our fathers here in the Golan. Uh, guys, it was a pleasure. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and thank you, ZOA, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. And good luck with this initiative of young professionals. It's, it's amazing and it's important. Thank you, everyone, for joining our ZOA Young Professionals Group Kickoff event. We were honored to feature Yaakov and Rabbi El Ghazi, both of whom greatly, greatly informed us of Eli Cohen's legendary and heroic life and the significance of his incredible missions. The Netflix show, The Spy, reinvigorated interest in Eli for those familiar with his remarkable bravery and introduced him internationally to a new audience. The ZOA prides itself on being an active pro-Israel organization which counters anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism while upholding the benefits of a strong U.S.-Israel relationship through lobbying efforts, on-campus support, and in the media. The Young Professionals Group hopes to be an extension of the great work the ZOA does and extend its outreach to the next generation of pro-Israel advocates. We plan on developing many more interesting programming events and we hope you will join us. Please contact Judy or Natalie for more information if interested in being a member of our group. A special thank you to Yaakov and Rabbi al -Ghaze, and thank you to Judy and Natalie for leading us, um, for leading the effort to make this event come to life. Thank you all so much. Thank you everyone.